Um, our lecture today is about orthodontic assessment. We're going to cover, them, uh, cover orthodontic assessment in two lectures. The first one will be discussing extraoral examination, and the second one will discuss the intraoral examination. So to provide a proper orthodontic treatment in which you provide a good result for your patient, starting from uh, crowded teeth into a well-aligned dentition and making them having a very nice and happy smile, that goes into a sequence of steps. The first one will be the history examination and diagnosis. And then you collect all the information that you got from history and examination. Then you have a database of information. Then you analyze this information to come up with a problem list. So the patient now, what are the things that um, not correct? And basically it's a problematic and it needs to be corrected then to decide what is your aim of treatment? So which problems are you going to accept and which problems are you going to correct? For example, a patient with a class 2 skeletal uh, mild one, he's not complaining about his profile, we can accept that one. So you, you need to decide your treatment aims and then you give the patients the options for the treatment. So there will always be more than one option for the treatment. Then you give him the informed consent and he will sign the consent and then we start the definitive treatment. Through the coming lectures, we will cover all this one. But for the today's lecture, we're going to cover only the examination, the extraoral one, then the coming lecture, intraoral examination, and later um, treatment planning and all the steps um, is shown here. So we'll start first with uh, clinical examination. We'll start always with the history. So what history we need to check? The first one is the reason for attendance, so why a patient is here. Now, the most important part about the history is to ask the patient to describe why they are here with their own words, not with our complicated terminology. They need to let the patient speak about what the problem that they are having. Now, usually patients will have chief complain about the appearance of the teeth. However, when you take the history, you need to be very specific about the um, aesthetic or the appearance. So let's assume that this patient here attending the clinic and she said, I don't like the color of my teeth. Then correcting the color of the teeth will be by doing bleaching, not orthodontic treatment. But if she said, I don't like the color and the alignment of the teeth, then yeah, we need to do an orthodontic treatment. So this is the difference. If the patient said, I don't like the shape of my teeth, then orthodontic treatment can do nothing for her. And this is very important when patients usually, uh, they, they are kind of picturing a veneer kind of teeth in their mind. So you need to make sure that they want the alignment rather than the shape, or at least the alignment to be as part of the treatment. Then if some patients might be concerned about the dental health. So basically, if they have crowding, it will be more difficult to clean their teeth. However, all the evidence said that Orthodontic treatment will not have a better um, black index or better black control because simply if the patients want to take care of their teeth, they will take care of their teeth. So you can see here oral hygiene is good, although there's a lot of crowding. So what happens usually if the teeth are crowded, usually it will be more difficult to clean. Patients need to spend more time to clean, but if they have enough motivation, they will clean it. So basically orthodontic treatment will make their life easier. Now, some patients will attend your clinic complaining about speech problem, like, for example, lisping or eating problem if they have an anterior open bite. Sometimes the patient will be referred to the clinic just simply to help in a restorative treatment. Um, uh, if a patient has an extraction space that is, half, uh, that is closed partially and you need to reopen this space so they can place a proper restoration. Uh, sometimes the patient doesn't really know why he is here or sometimes the mom will be the one who is bringing the patient to the clinic and she had the complaint and in this situation you just need to make sure that the patient is cooperative and is willing to take the treatment not is forced to start the treatment because thrombotic treatment is a long treatment in which you need the patient's cooperation. Then after you finish reason for attendance you need to check the medical history um, there's a big list of the medical history that would be um, covered in a separate lecture called Medical Problem in, and Orthodontics. However, just uh, to quickly say about the nickel allergy, 
Now, um, all the components, or like most of our brackets, is made of stainless steel, archwire stainless steel, uh, nickel titanium archwire. They have nickel, so patients who have an allergy to nickel, they might have allergy for the brackets. However, uh, usually uh, the intraoral uh, allergy for brackets is less, or for nickel, is less intraorally compared to the extraoral. And there's two reasons or two possible explanation for that. The first one is the presence of the saliva. It will make it less concentrated, let's put it this way. And the other uh, feel, uh, like, uh, hypothesis that the histocyte responsible for the allergic reaction is less sensitive intraorally compared to the extraoral one. So basically, if the patient has an allergy extraorally extra for nickel, that doesn't mean necessarily that he will have an allergy intraorally. However, we have always to be careful. The symptoms of allergy is usually a redness uh, that is associated with a good oral hygiene. So one of the methods sometimes if a patient is allergic to nickel extraorally, or at least he doesn't know if he's allergic or not, you can simply place one bracket on one tooth and observe the patient after two to three days and see if there is a redness near that area, that means he is allergic. If not, he, he might not be allergic intraorally. The second um, medical disorder that we need to check is bisphosphonate. Basically, bisphosphonate is given to the patient uh, who has, for example, osteoporosis. It inhibits the effect of the osteoclast, so it reduces the bone desorption. However, usually, when we do orthodontic treatment, we need to uh, move teeth, and that involves resorption. Uh, sorry, uh, to a bone resorption and deposition. In these cases, it's better that you don't take the decision yourself and you refer the patient to his physician to take the decision for you. Um, about dental history, usually you need to check how many, um, when the patient attended the clinic, uh, that, um, the last time attended the dental clinic, if he's a regular attendee or not, if he done a restoration before or not, um, so, for example, if a patient said, I never attended the dental clinic, then this is a not cooperative patient expecting a lot of filling and that is need to be done. However, if the patient is a regular attendee, they will expect a better oral hygiene, a better filling. The other thing is the history of trauma. So, if you can see here that the third tooth is discolored, taking a periapical, you can see that this tooth has been treated using a root canal treatment due to the trauma. Now, why trauma is important? Because one, maybe patient had a trauma and he never do a radiograph and go to the dentist and then the tooth is necrotic and he doesn't know about it. So you need to check the vitality of the tooth, check the mobility, uh, check the periabical to check if there is any periabical radiolucency. Um, sometimes the tooth will become ankylosed to the bone due to the trauma. So you need to do a percussion test to make sure that you don't have a metallic sound that resulted from ankylosis. And um, also the resorption associated with the trauma. So some patient might have an external root resorption due to the trauma. And what we know that one of the highest risk for root resorption due to orthodontic treatment is teeth or are the teeth that already has an external root resorption due to trauma. So this is something that you need to investigate carefully before you start orthodontic treatment. Habits as well is important. And one of the most important habits that we have is the thumb sucking habit, in which basically the patient who replaced the uh, tongue between the teeth resulted in the proclination of the upper retroclination of the lower incisors, asymmetrical anterior bite and cross bite. And the reason why I need to check this one, because that can give you an explanation for the malocclusion. And also because before you start any orthodontic treatment, habit should, be, should stop before any treatment is provided. Then you need to check the patient's concern and motivation now and expectation. So if, if the patient motivation to get a new job and he's working in IT, for example, that has nothing to do with the appearance of the teeth, then this is kind of motivation that you need to be careful with. Expectation, if patients want to have an orthodontic treatment and he wants his teeth at the end to be extremely white with a perfect shape, then we can do that because with orthodontics, which change the position of the teeth. So you need to know exactly what is the motivation and what is the expectation of your patient. Socioeconomic behavior is well important because patient people usually or patients with a lower socioeconomic status, usually they have more caries, less attendance to the dentist and more uh, a poor diet full of um, sugars and carbohydrates. So, uh, uh, sorry, unhealthy carbohydrates. So you need to check that properly. 
So then after finishing history, we need to move to the clinical examination. Now, before starting clinical examination, just need to um, bring your attention the differences about the perception between different racial background, different cultural and gender differences. So what some society find, for example, unacceptable or unattractive might be found attractive in other society. Um, example for that is the protrusion of the teeth. Um, some society, they like protrusive dentition, while other one, they like retrusive dentition. So you just need sometimes to check the back racial background of your patient when you're doing the examination, especially in the multinational community where you have people from different races uh, attended your clinic. So when we do clinical examination, you need to do extraoral assessment, which will be covered in this lecture, and intraoral assessment, which will be covered in next lecture. So intraoral assessment, we divided it into skeletal, smile aesthetic, and soft tissue assessment, and the last one is TMG. So we'll start with the skeletal assessment. The first one is, how are you going to position your patient when you do the assessment? So if you look at these three photographs and you can notice that in the photo here, the mandible is retruded and the patient is a class two. Well, if you look at the photo in the middle, the patient is maybe straight class one profile. But in this one, he's, she is class three. So the difference is basically the position of the head. Here, the head is kind of straight. This one, the head is tilted anteriorly, so the mandible moves posteriorly. While in this one, the head is tilted posteriorly and the mandible move anteriorly. So, the way you position the patient during the examination will affect the examination outcome. So, in, in back in the time, Frankfurt plane parallel to the floor was used to do an extraoral assessment. So basically, draw a line from orbitally to the external podium, which is the outermost, uppermost point of the external auditory matrix. This one should be parallel to the floor. This line was fairly good. However, this line is an anatomical line, and it works in most of the patient, but not all of them, because some an anatomical variation present between people or between patient and sometimes if you position the patient in the anatomical position you might force him to the position that he's not like it all the time so which position is better nowadays we believe the natural hip position so simply you ask the patient to look at a point in front of him that or to a mirror to look to his eyes into the mirror so basically he's doing what we call it the natural hip position so when the patient has the natural head position, this is a physiological position that is determined by the patient and it's fairly reproducible position. And this is the position that we prefer the patient to be examined with over the uh, Frankfurt brain parallel to the floor. You just need to think and remember that when you do examination, you're doing examination in three planes, not only on one plane. You do skeletal examination, the anterior posterior dimension, vertical dimension, and transverse dimension. And I want to stress point here that whenever you do examination or whenever you do treatment planning and you think in orthodontics, whether when you're examining the patient or planning your orthodontic treatment or planning your anchorage, you always need to think in three planes, anterior, posterior, vertical, and transverse. So how we do the anterior posterior examination? So we need to start with the definition of a class one skeleton, which basically the maxilla is two to three millimeter in front of the mandible. So this is the maxilla, this is the mandible. The normal thing that the maxilla should be ahead, not in the same plane, ahead of the mandible by two to three millimeter. So what represents the maxilla is the A point, which is the deepest concavity on the anterior part of the maxilla. And what represents mandible is the B point, which is the most uh, the deepest conca point in the anterior conca or the, in the concavity of the mandibular symphysis, which is this area here. So basically, this is the A point and this is the B point, and the difference between them should be within two to three millimeter with the maxilla ahead of the mandible. And this is when we say that the patient is a class one. 
Now, if the difference between the maxilla and the mandible as represented by the A and B point is more than 2 to 3 millimeter, as we can see in this uh, photograph, then the patient is a class 2. If the difference is more than 2 to 3 millimeter, but in this time, the mandible is ahead of the maxilla, or sometimes they are in the same, same line, then this is called, we call it class 3 skeletal relationship. So how to assess the A and B point? So you need to check where is the A and B point on the patient's face. Now one way to do it is to use what we call it Kettle's method. So basically use the index and middle finger and palpate the patient's uh, face and you see where is the A point and where is the B point. Now usually the index finger usually is shorter than the middle finger by two to three millimeter. So if the index and the middle finger touches the maxilla and mandible at the same time, it means that the difference between them is two to three millimeter and that the patient's a class one. But if the patient is a class two, and I need you to use your imagination here a little bit, that is caused by either the maxilla being prognathic or the mandible being retrognathic. So let's assume that you have a patient with a retrognathic mandible. So when you approach the patient with the index and the middle finger this way, the first thing that's gonna hit the patient's face is the index finger. Then, in order to have the middle finger touches uh, the B point, which is the mandible, the hand has to rotate in a clockwise rotation. Rotation. It has to go downward. If this happens, then this is the patient is a class two. The opposite will happen if the patient is a class three, in which, for example, the mandible is a prognathic. So when you approach the patient, the first one to touch is the uh, middle finger. And then the patient will rotate his hand, the, the, sorry, the examiner will rotate his hand counterclockwise until or upward until the index finger is touching the B point. So by that time, this the patient is a class uh, three. But I just want to say here that this method will tell you if the patient is a class one, class two, or a class three, but it will not tell you what is the etiology. Is it maxilla or mandible? We're going to see later how to distinguish. Uh, the second method that we can use, so this is the first method to decide if patient's class 1 or class 2 or class 3 using Kettle's method. Some authors, they just simply uh, use um, by, by looking by their eyes, looking at the A point and the B point and see the difference between them. Uh, I just want to say as well here, when you use the Kettle's method, you need to palpate the bone structure. So if you touch the soft tissue, you need to squeeze your hand hard until you reach to the underlying uh, heart or bone structure. The second method to decide if the patient is a class 1 or a class 2 or a class 3 is to look to something we call it convexity of the face. So what does that mean? Simply you look at three points and then you check how convex are they. So these three points are sub are, uh, glabella, which is the base of the frontal bone or the most prominent part between the two eyebrows, then subnasally, which is the base of the nose or the junction between the philtrum and columella, and the last point is Pogonian. I remember that whenever we use any anterior posterior relationship, we use Pogonian as a point. So if the angle between them is between 165 and 175, so they are almost straight, then this is class one relationship. Now, if the angle between them is less than 165, like we can see here, we call this is convex relationship, and this is a class two relationship. If it's the opposite, the patient has a concave relationship, we say that this uh, class three relationship. Remember again that the facial convexity and the Kettle's method will not tell you the etiology of the class one or a class two or a class three. It only tells you if the patient is a class one or a class two or a class three. So if you want to know if the etiology is maxilla or mandible, you need to check the AB position of the maxilla and the AB position of the mandible. For example, if the patient is a class two, like we can see here, it could be due to retrognathic mandible or prognathic maxilla. So we have to use some tools to tell us the position of the maxilla and the position of the mandible. The first tool that we can use is called the zero meridian line. So the zero meridian line is the line that you draw perpendicular to the natural head to the, um, the original one was to the Frankfurt plane, which basically goes from orbitally to porion. 
but we can use it as well with the patient in the natural head position because we change the way we examine patient. And then you have this line and you drop a line perpendicular to this true horizontal line and that was called um, the, that's a zero meridian line. So again, the original zero meridian line used the Frankfurt plane and then now we slightly use it with the natural head position so we use what we call it the true horizontal line which basically a line that is parallel to the floor. However, so you got this Frankfurt or slash uh, true horizontal line, then you get a line from Nasian that is perpendicular, having a 90 degree to the Frankfurt plane, and you drop it down. Now, the subnasari, which is this point, should be sitting on this line or two millimeter ahead of this line. If the subnasari is more than two millimeter to this line, as we can see in this photograph, it means that the maxilla is prognatic. So subnasali should be on this line or two millimeter ahead. If it's more than two millimeter, then the maxilla is a prognatic, and that can tell you about the etiology of the malocclusion. The second method to evaluate the maxillary position is looking at the anatomy of the maxilla. How is that? Now remember that the maxilla is a huge bone in the mid face. It has many processes. The first process is this one, which is the alveolar process that carries the teeth, and we see. The second process is the zygomatic process, the nasal process, the infraorbital process. So if the maxilla is retrognathic, the teeth will be pushed posteriorly with the alveolar process, and as well the zygomatic process and the infraorbital process and the um, nasal process. So the whole mid face will be pushed posteriorly as well if maxilla is the etiology or if the maxilla is retrognathic. So if you can see this patient here and this patient here, you can compare the maxilla between these two patients. So if you look here, the patient has cheeks. He has some like bulging here. While this patient here, it is flat. There is nothing next to the, to the nose. And if you look at the infraorbital rim, which was, it was part of it is the infraorbital process of the maxilla, you can see that the globe of the eye is immediately kind of like is even more prominent than the cheek. So there is no infraorbital rim. There is no zygoma as well. The zygomatic process of the maxilla is retruded. So there is no prominence in this area. We call this one malar hypoplasia, in which the patient does not really has a zygoma. And also, if you look at the sides of the nose and it's flat, and there is nothing there. We call it paranasal, which means it's surrounding the nose from both sides, hollowing, like empty, paranasal hollowing because of that. That's a feature of the maxillary retrognathia. So basically, when you have a patient with a class three, you can first start by using the zero meridian line and check the position of the subnasali, and then you can check with the 3D position of the maxilla using the paranasal hollowing and the uh, malar hypoplasia. And if you look from below the patient, you can see the flatness. There is no cheeks. We call this paranasal hollowing. Now, we decided the position of the maxilla, so we need to check the position of the mandible. Again, we use the zero meridian line. We drop a line perpendicular to the Frankfurt plane through Nasian, and then the chin, or the represented by the begonium, should be sitting on this line, or like zero, or plus minus two, according to this line. So if we look here at this photograph, and we know that this, this is the zero meridian line, and we said that subnasally is on this line or two millimeter anterior. We can notice here that it's more than two millimeter anterior to this line, while Bogonian is sitting on this line. So that means that this patient has a prognatic maxilla. Now be careful that the zero meridian line is not telling you about the AB class one or class two or class three. So here, if you look to the glabella subnasally bogonian, and you can see that this profile is convex profile. So then, yes, this is a class two, but then it doesn't tell you what the etiology until you use the zero meridian line and check the position of the maxilla and mandible. The other method to check the mandibular position is to use the true vertical line. What is the true vertical line? It's the line that is passing through subnasally 
and it should be perpendicular to the true horizontal line or the let's say the floor. Now, when you use this uh, true vertical line, you should use it when the maxilla is in the right position. So you know the maxilla in the right position. You drop this line from subnasally, then bugonian should be sitting on this line or slightly posterior, as we can see in this photograph. So that tells you now the maxilla is in the right place, the mandible is in the right place. Actually, the patient is class one. So you can't use this line if uh, the maxilla is not in the right place, like here. So if you drop here subnasally, you can see that the mandible is far posterior to this line. This is because the maxilla is ahead. So remember, the true vertical line is used when the maxilla is already in the correct position. So now we are done with the anteroposterior relationship, we go to the vertical relationship. When you assess the vertical relationship, there's two things that you need to assess. First, the rule of third, and second is the growth rotation. So, the rule of third, basically, you convert the lower facial third into the rest of the face, particularly the middle third of the face. So, when you measure the facial height, or using the facial third, you start with from the hairline to the glabella, and then from the glabella to subnasally, and then from subnasally to uh, mentor. So the glabella, as we said before, is the most prominent part between the two eyebrows of the frontal bone. Subnasally is the base of the nose or the junction between the philtrum and columella, while menton is the lowermost point of the mandibular symphysis. Um, when you examine the facial convexity, remember that we are using pogonium in the mandible. When we're doing the vertical, we are using menton. And the reason for that, because each point there is something we call it, and we're going to talk about that when we discuss lateral cave called envelope of error. So basically, you are using the point in a way that you check in which plane this point will have more error. For example, if we are going to use menton, the, the mistake placing the menton will be in the anterior posterior dimension because it's the lowermost point, not in the vertical dimension. So it will be more accurate in the vertical relationship rather than anterior posterior relationship. For that reason, I will use Minton to assess any vertical relationship. And that's why we are using Minton here to assess the vertical relationship and between the lower facial third and the middle facial third. While the Bugonian is the most prominent part between a bit of the mandibular symphysis. So when you place the Bugonian, usually it's the most prominent one. So you will not have problem in the anterior posterior position or position Bugonian. However, you might have a little bit of issues by placing it vertically. So, the most accurate when using Bugonian is the anterior posterior relationship. For that reason, we use Bugonian to decide the convexity of the profile, while we use Minton to decide the vertical relationship in the maxilla. Hope that was clear. So, in this patient, for example, the lower facial third is this, and the middle facial third, we call this reduced lower facial third. Now then you subdivide the lower third of the face into by line, ba line passing through stomium, which is the junction between the upper and lower lip. So the lower lip with the chin should be two-thirds of the lower facial third, while the upper lip from stomium into the subnasally should be another third. So one-third here and two-thirds here. That's how a well-proportioned face will be. And then you need to check what we call it growth rotation. And growth rotation will be covered in more details in the lecture of growth. However, we know that from Bjork work that we have two types of growth rotation, either an upward and forward rotation or downward and backward rotation. So if you look at this photograph here, this is the solid line represent the mandible, and this is the dotted line the mandible after rotation. So you can see that the mandible drop downward and backward. We call this posterior growth rotation. While in the photograph here, you can see the solid line here, while this is the dotted line. So the mandible is moving upward and forward in two planes, upward and forward. So basically, you need to check if the patient has an anterior growth rotation or posterior growth rotation. And how to do this clinically, you check the Frankfurt plane and the mandibular plane. If the Frankfurt plane intersects with the mandibular plane just behind the occiput, it means that this angle is increased. It means that the mandible is gone posteriorly. It means that we have a posterior growth rotation or downward and backward rotation. Uh, and if these two lines, they don't meet posterior to the occiput, they just 
infinity or they meet further posterior to the occiput sorry they don't mean posterior to the ear that's what i meant that means that the mandibular growth is anterior growth rotation just a piece of advice when you do this in the clinic a lot of mistakes done by uh, our resident that they use the mirror around the angle of the mandible you is doing this you will get always posterior growth rotation remember that the mandibular plane goes from gonion into menton Gonion is the angle of the mandible, the most inferior posterior point, point of the mandible, and mandibular angle, and then menton the lowermost point. So try to touch both of them with your mirror or with your ruler, and then compare them to the Frankfurt plane, and you see the rotation of the mandible. So, if the mandible rotated downward and backward, as we can see here, we are expecting that this distance will increase because simply the mandible is going downward and backward so that means that this distance here will increase so we're expecting with patient with the class with posterior growth rotation that patient will have uh, um, increased lower facial height and because of that we will have an anterior open bite the opposite will happen with a patient who has an anterior growth rotation because you are expecting with this anterior growth rotation that this distance will be reduced or this distance here will be reduced because the mandible is going upward and forward. In most of the cases, the answer is yes. Anterior growth rotation will result in reduced lower facial height and posterior growth rotation will result in increased lower facial height. However, this is not the case in every case. I will show you how. This is the famous actress, our singer, Carol Samaha. If you look at this, is this is the Frankfurt plane and this is the mandibular plane. And you can see that they are never meeting. So this patient has an anterior growth rotation. So what do you expect that the lower facial third is reduced because she has an anterior growth rotation? Well, when you look to the face, you can see that the lower facial third is equal to the middle facial third and she has no reduced lower facial third. Okay, so but she has an anterior growth rotation. All right, so what happened is that when the rotation happened, the center of rotation was around the lower central incisor. And that resulted in increase in the posterior facial height by increasing the ramus height. So when the rotation happened, the chin point stay where it is, stayed where it is, and the mandible grow posteriorly to compensate for this rotation. So what happened at the angle of the mandible, let's say, was here, it dropped down here. So now we have an anterior growth rotation, but this anterior growth rotation is not associated with reduced lower facial height, but it is associated with increased ramus height or posterior facial height. So, and the opposite can happen in patients with posterior growth rotation. For that reason, when you do the assessment and you find a patient with posterior growth rotation, you don't jump and say he has a reduced lower facial height. You need to measure it. And then if you measure the lower facial height and it was reduced, and then you measure the growth rotation and it was anterior growth rotation, so you will say a patient has a reduced lower facial height due to anterior growth rotation. However, not every patient, again, with anterior growth rotation necessarily will have a reduced lower facial height. You need to check case by case. And then we have to check the transverse relationship. Basically, you need to check symmetry. So the first method to check symmetry is to drop a line dividing the face into two halves. We call it the mid-sagittal plane. The chin should be sitting on this line. And you, when you use this line, you should ignore the nose because sometimes the nose will be shifted to one side. That will be misleading to us. You completely ignore the nose. So if example, if you drop a line like this one, dividing the face into two halves, you can see and notice that the chin is deviated to the right side of the patient. And as well here, I have to mention that we are looking for obvious asymmetry, not minimal or mild asymmetry, because none of us is 100% symmetrical. And if I start looking at my face, for example, carefully in the mirror, I will find many asymmetries that uh, is minimal and, and not worth treatment. For that reason as well, I prefer in the clinic that you use the terminology no clinically significant asymmetry rather than saying that his face or her face is symmetrical because no one has a symmetrical face. If in the clinic you want to make sure about your diagnosis, you can do the bird view. 
So you are looking like a bird to the patient from above of them. So you can see here, and you look from above and you check the position of the chin. For example, here you can see that the chin is deviated to the right side of the patient. Or yeah. The second method to assess asymmetry, we call it the rule of fifth. And basically you divide the face into five fifths. You look by the, from the outer side, side of the ear, outer lobe of the ear, sorry, to the outer canthus, then to the inner canthus, then to the inner canthus on the other side, outer canthus and outer lobe of the ear. Now this outer fifth should be similar size to this outer fifth. The inner fifth should be as well equal to this fifth. And then we have the middle fifth in which the chin should be sitting on this, the middle of this line. So that was the assessment of the extra orally in the skeletal relationship, anteroposterior, vertical, and transverse. And then we move into the smile aesthetic and assessment of the fly. And the first one to examine is the incisal show on smiling and the incisal show at rest. So basically, when you examine the incisal show on smiling, simply you ask the patient, smile the best you can. Give me the maximum smile that you can do. And when you record the smile, you need and the smile size that shown smiling, you record it by the percentage of the amount of the incisor that is shown. For example, in this patient, uh, I don't say that the amount of the incisal show is nine millimeter. Because the full clinical crown is nine millimeter, I would say the patient is showing full clinical crown. If the patient is showing half of the clinical crown, don't say she's showing four millimeters, you say she's showing half of the clinical crown. And this is because to avoid any confusion, because some patients might have a short clinical crown. And if you say that, for example, the length of the crown is eight millimeter, and then you can say, patient is showing eight millimeter. I would think that she has a reduced lower facial height because eight millimeter is not usually showing the whole crown because the crown is 10 millimeter. So we need to say is about how much is showing from the incisors. Normally, and the attractive one, is the patient showing the full clinical crown with one to two millimeter of the interdental gingiva. So if you can see here, this is kind of a good smile, but this patient here, she's showing the crown, the interdental gingiva, and on top of that, three millimeter of uh, gingiva, we call this a gummy smile, all right? So when you have a gummy smile, we have a four possible causes for the gummy smile. The first one is the patient having vertical maxillary excess, so the whole maxilla is dropped down. The second one is that the patient has a hyperactive upper lip, which basically the, everything is in normal position, but when the patient is smiling, the maxilla, the lip is lifted up. The third reason is the patient having a short upper lip, so everything is normal, but the lips is short especially the upper one. Or the third reason is the short clinical crown. And in these cases, patients need just simply crown lengthening to increase the length of the crown. So how in the clinic can we distinguish between the etiology of, or the etiology of these four causes? We look at the incisal show at rest, as we can see in this photograph. How to examine patient incisal show at rest? Simply to ask a patient to lick their lips, and then they say, Emma the word Emma and they stop and they relax. The normal amount of the incisor show at rest is a three millimeter in males and three to four millimeters in females. So usually females shows more. Now, if the incisor show at rest me, well, major, and it was increased as we can see in this patient, that means that when the patient's smiling and having gummy smile, the possible etiology is a vertical maxillary excess. The whole maxilla is down. So whether the patient is resting or patient is smiling, the patient will show more of the incisors. Or, or the patient has a short upper lip. That's why he's showing a lot of the gingiva. Now, to diagnose it, first you check if the patient has increased incisor and show at rest. And the patient, so start over again, patient has a gummy smile, you check then the amount of the incisor show at rest. If it's increased, then it could be vertical maxillary excess or short upper lip. How to distinguish between both of them, you measure the upper lip. And later on, I'm going to show you uh, how to measure the upper lip. Now, if the incisal, if patient has a gummy smile, but then the incisal show at rest is normal, it means that the vertical position of the incisor is correct, but why the patient has a gummy smile? Simply because something we call it hyperactive upper lip. 
When the patient is smiling, the lip is retracted above the teeth more than they should be. So we'll have a gummy smile. And in these cases, the treatment will be a Botox to prevent this hyper movement rather than, rather than, and that's why it, the agnosis is very important, rather than intrusion of the incisors. Because if you treat in this case with hyperactive upper lip, the ins when you decide to do intrusion, then you will correct the incisal show on smiling. But you know what's going to happen? The patient will show no teeth during the incisal show at rest. Because at rest it's normal, let's assume it's three millimeter, and you decided to treat the gummy smile, I'm going to intrude the incisors by three millimeter or two millimeter. So then she's showing at rest only one millimeter or no teeth. So she will appear older than her age while she can treat it simply by Botox. The other cause, if the lower incisal show at rest is normal, is a short clinical crown. So basically, if a patient has a short clinical crown and the patient smiles normally, he will show a gingiva. And the treatment in this case is a crown lengthening. So to summarize up, if a patient has a gummy smile, you need to check the incisal show at rest. If it's normal, then uh, the etiology could be hyperactive upper lip or short upper incisors. If it's abnormal and it's increased, that means either we have a vertical maxillary excess or short upper lip. Then we need to check the smile arc, which basically you look at the curvature joining the incisors, uh, canines, and, and the both sides. This curvature should follow the curvature of the lip. If the curvature of the incisors follow the curvature of the lip, we call this consonant smile, and that's smile arc. Now, in some of the papers published, it said that if this smiling arc is not consonant, that will make the patient less attractive smile, and if, for example, it's flat, we'll give him an older appearance. Then you need to check the smile width, which basically the buccal corridor, which is defined as the negative lateral space between the buccal surface of the distal most maxillary molar and the angle of the mouth, which usually in millimeter, it should be on average 11.5 millimeters, 5 to 16 uh, millimeter. If the space is more, you can see more black we call it excessive buccal corridor. If you see less of that space and you see more of teeth, more of teeth, you say reduced buccal corridor. So when you treat the patient, you need to check if really he has a reduced buccal corridor or not, because again, that will change your treatment plan. For example, this patient here, she has a good buccal corridor, average one. So my treatment will not be focusing on expansion. While this patient here, he has an excessive buccal corridor, which means that I need, when I do my treatment plan, to expand the upper arch slightly. Now, there's multiple factors affecting the buccal corridor. The first one is the arch form. If a patient has a narrow arch, then he will expect to have a bigger uh, buccal corridor. And if he has a wider arch, he will expect to have a narrower buccal corridor. The anterior posterior position of the maxilla. If the maxilla is pushed posteriorly, remember that the maxilla narrower part is anterior and the wider part posteriorly. So if the maxilla moved posteriorly, then the wider part of the maxilla is moved posteriorly and the patient will have more excessive buccal corridor. So sometimes the problem is the AB position of the maxilla rather than transverse position of the maxilla. Then again, if the patient has a transverse maxillary deficiency, then he will have an excessive buccal corridor. In these cases, we can do expansion. If the incisors are lingually or palatally tipped or inclined, then that will increase the buccal corridor. Then after you decided the whole position of the... So we are doing now, you see, we're examining the patient, we are building knowledge, so we examine the skeletal relationship, we see, we saw that the physiology of, is it maxilla, is it mandible, then we look to the smile and we assess the smile because when we see about the treatment planning lecture, the smile aesthetic is very important, then now we need to decide where is the best anteroposterior position of the upper incisors. So if you have a patient, for example, and like this one, she's a class two skeletal with increased overjet. So your treatment can be either retraction of the upper incisors to reduce this overjet or proclination of the lower incisors to reduce the overjet. Now, in order to be able to decide which one is the treatment, you need to do what is in the best aesthetic for the patient. This is, will be discussed more in details in the treatment planning lecture, but for now, so you need to decide 
whether the upper has to go posteriorly or the lower has to move forward. One method to do that is to use something we call it uh, the nas uh, zero meridian line, the same as the zero meridian line. You drop it from Nasian and it's perpendicular to the Frankfurt plane. And the upper incisors should be sitting on this line or maximum two millimeter anterior to it, just plus minus two millimeter. That was developed by Andrews when he said about the six element to normal occlusion, not the six key, six element to normal occlusion. So when you treat the patient, you should try to aim uh, to retract the incisors to be in line with uh, this line proposed by Andrews. However, it's worth mentioning here that AB position from the evidence is not really correlated with the AB position of the incisor of the protrusion of the lips or movement of the incisors is not an AB dependent on, I'm um, sorry, I just need to say this again. I mean, AB position of the upper incisors does not affect or like not in a one-to-one -one ratio to the AB position of the lips. Meaning, if I have a protrusive lip and I decided to do extraction and retraction of the incisors, if I attracted the incisors 10 millimeter, that does not necessarily mean that the lip will be retracted by 10 millimeter. And also, if I push the incisors, let's say five millimeter forward, that doesn't mean necessarily that the lips will be pushed forward because soft tissue they can adapt sometimes the tooth movement. Meaning, if for example, I draw this line and I found that the upper incisors are sitting in front of this line, but then this, even though they are pushed in front of this line, the patient's profile, the soft tissue has taken it, they adapted to it, they are not moved excessively forward, then it's not necessarily that I have to bring this tooth posteriorly. So when do I have to bring the teeth posteriorly? I need to look at the competency of the lip protrusion of the lip, how much the patient is struggling to bring the two lips together. Because if the patient is struggling to bring the two lips together, that means that these two teeth are, or the teeth are pushed forward. And then extraction and retraction will improve the patient profile because you will improve the lip competency. And so you'll be attending more or going more into extraction treatment rather than non-extraction non because a non-extraction treatment will make him look worse. So if you compare it here, that's a textbook a photograph from textbook of Prophet, um, contemporary orthodontics. So you can see in the photo on the right side here that the lips are more comfortable, the nasolabiumental fold is fine, patients are achieving lip competency easily compared to this protrusive profile. So this is before and this is after, as you can see, patients treated by extraction. Here in these cases, the incisors are retracted to achieve a proper competency of the lip. So what trying to focus on here, that we, we use the line that is mentioned by Andrews as a guide for us. But what is important more is that how the lips reacted. Are they competent? Are they not competent? Are you feeling protrusive with the lip? Are they struggling to be together? Do you feel that these incisors are sitting between the upper and lower lip and pushing them forward? In these cases, we should go for extraction and retraction. We said that the incisors are either protrusive. Now, incisor AB position is not the only one that is, that is uh, should be mentioned or should be recorded. The other thing that we should record is the inclination of the labial surface in the profile view. So what do I mean by that one? Uh, I like this paper that is done in, in Lebanon, in which they got the patients and they manipulated the inclination of the teeth. So how do you measure the inclination? You get first into the natural head position and you did the true horizontal line and then you draw a tangent from the most prominent part of the incisor to this line. Now tangent means that the line touching the most prominent surface of this circle. So the incisor you see the most prominent part and you draw this line. So in this research they manipulated this angle and they evaluated the attractiveness of the smile. And what they found, that the most attractive smile is when the patient having a 93 degrees into this true vertical line, a true horizontal line. From all the evidence that we have from different papers, that because this is not the only job is done, we can notice that the patient like this angle to be between 80 and 90 degree or 93. So these incisors has to go down back posteriorly, as you can see here. So if you do this, 
this is again how the angle is measured so this angle this incisor has to be not retracted that's very important just the angle of the incisor the inclination the torque value should be corrected in this way so that the angle here should be between 80 and 90 and that's more attractive smile and if you see this patient this is an example if i drop the line here from nasian as a um, proposed by um, uh, Andrews, six element to norm occlusion, we can see that this incisor is only one or two millimeter ahead of the line. However, patient is not happy, and the reason is the inclination. The teeth are excessively proclined. The patient doesn't like them. So one way to do that is to simply correct the torque of these incisors by applying a, a lingual crown torque, or what we call it buckle or labial crown torque. However, doing that, as you can see, we did apply a buccal crown torque, uh, sorry, buccal root torque. So the incisors now are simply uprighted. Compare this one to this one. And this is the profile, and this is how now she's much happier. So inclination is very important. Um, but here when you do applying a buccal labial torque, uh, or buccal root torque or labial root torque you just need to make sure that you will not end up by pushing these roots outside the bone because here the crown will stay where it is or it will go posteriorly just a little bit but the main movement is the root movement so you don't want to end up kicking the roots outside the bone for that reason you need to check carefully by taking a lateral calf and you see how much labial how much bone is presented labially if you have enough bone, then you can do this movement. If you don't have enough bone, then you don't do it. Then at that case, you need to do extraction. Because then you retract the incisors slightly, there will be plenty of bone, and then you correct the inclination of the incisors. So again, inclination of the incisor is very important. You will see a lot of patients in the clinic coming, complaining about protrusion, but in reality, they are not protruded. They are a procline. So if the teeth are protruded, then we retract them. But if they are brocline, we try to modify or to correct the torque, given that this will not result in um, dehiscence and fenestration of the bones surrounding the roots. That's a lateral kiff to show you what I'm talking about. So here, you take a lateral kiff, you check how much bone you have. So when you apply a buccal or labial root torque, you can see that thin rim of bones left compared to this one. So we have plenty of bone at the beginning. But imagine if you have a thin bone at the beginning, like here, so you will end up kicking definitely the root outside the bone. So when, when you apply this one, you need to be very and extra careful not to push the root outside the bone, maybe to take more than x-ray during the treatment. If you feel that the roots will move out, you just need to do extraction. Not to over retract the incisor, no, just to move them slightly posteriorly. Now they have bones surrounding them and then give them the correct bone torque. So to summarize the anterior posterior position of the upper incisors, now if you use the sex element to normal occlusion, uh, drop a line from Nasian, it's perpendicular to the, um, usually we use now through horizontal line. Uh, the upper incisor should be sitting on this line, slightly anterior posterior within two millimeter, and then you check the inclination, and as we said, the upper incisor should be almost 90 degrees. Now, I don't want you to get confused when we say true vertical, and then we use Frankfurt plane, and then we use true horizontal. The thing is, we used to use, in the past, the Frankfurt plane as a reference. But then, when we stopped using Frankfurt plane, and we start using natural head position to position the head of the patient we start not to use a frankfurt plane as a reference we start to use the horizontal the true horizontal plane and we don't use for example the zero meridian line we use the true vertical line however we need to make sure that uh, th that is not confusing you because the original value was obtained from frankfurt plane parallel to the floor so then we finish now smile analysis, we go to the soft tissue analysis. So when you examine the soft tissue, we examine the lips and we examine the tongue, and we're gonna start by examining the lips. When you examine the lips, you need to examine the lip line, lip activity, lip morphology, lip competency, and lip position. So the lip line, when you examine the patient, usually the lower lip should be covering one third of the upper incisors. 
while the upper incisor, the upper lip, should be covering two thirds of the upper incisors, which means during rest, as we mentioned before, the patient should be showing two to four millimeter of the incisors, because simply the upper lip is only covering the upper two thirds of the upper incisors. So when the patient relaxes the lip, the lips are not meeting together, he should be showing two to four millimeter, which is one third of the clinical crown. But if the lips are touching each other, then the lip in the lower should be covering one third of the upper incisors. And that's here we say the lip line as we mentioned before. When you examine the lip line as well, you need to examine the lip length. So we mentioned um, earlier that if a patient has a gummy smile, we need to check the lip length to know the etiology. So how to measure the lip length? We measure the lip length from subnasally to stomium superiorus, which is the most inferior point in the midline of the upper lip. So here, this is the midline, and then you look the most inferior point, and that's we call it stomium superiorus. Now, if the two lips are touching each other, we have only what we call it stomium which is the most anterior point in the midline of the contact between the upper and lower lip because the lips are touching. But if the lips are not touching, then we divide the two points. We have a stomium superiorus and stomium inferiorus. So again, stomium superiorus is the most inferior point in the midline of the upper lip. Okay, and if the lips are joining, then we use stomium as one terminology. So if you measure from stomium superior, stomium to subnasally, this in males should be 20 plus minus 2, and in female, 22 plus minus 2. So that helps us to diagnose the uh, lip length problem that we have it with the upper lip. We also can measure the philtrum length and the commissural length. This is again is the filtrum length, so you measure from subnasally to stomium superiors. While the commissural length, you measure it from this line, which is go through subnasally, and you then go with the perpendicular line to this line into the commissures, and we call this commissural height. Now, in a patient with normal facial proportion, the filtrum length should be two to three millimeters shorter than the um, commissural height. However, if the com Filtrum length is less uh, than, or the difference between them is more than two to three millimeter. It means that the filtrum length is shorter than it should be, and that means that the patient has a short upper lip. And that's one way to diagnose short upper lip. Then we need to diagnose the lip activity. Now, some patients, especially like class 2, division 2 patients, they will have a strap-like lower lip. The lip is strong that they are able to retrocline the upper and lower incisors all together. We call this a strap-like lower lip. And if, if you notice here, this is a class 2, division 2 case in which only the, the central and lateral are retroclined, while this upper lateral incisor is not. And this is because the lateral incisor is shorter than the upper central and it escaped the effect of the lower lip. So this photograph shows you how much strong is the lower lip that they are able to retrocline the lower and upper incisors. And this, this tooth escaped that one and is not retroclined because simply it's not under the control of the lower lip. Now then we need to look at the lip morphology. Some patient has a thin lips as the one here and some of them have a thick lips. Now, the response of the teeth to the orthodontic movement in the AB dimension or AB relationship is more in a patient with a thin lips compared to the patient with a thick lips. And the same if we procline and protrude the incisor. So if you decided to do an extraction treatment with this patient, you are expecting more retraction and more effect compared to this patient. And then we need to discuss lip competency I'm talking about the lips so when we say competent lips it means that the upper and the lower lip they meet together with minimal muscular effort it does not mean that without any muscular effort just minimal the patient does not have does not need to exert muscular force to bring the two lips together 
Then we have another terminology called potentially competent lips, which means that the teeth, they are, the lips, they are able to meet each other. Like in, they are prevented from doing so by the presence of the incisors that preventing the lower lip from reaching to the upper lip. We call this potentially competent because if you remove the effect of the incisors, the lips will be competent again. The other one is competent lips, in which that the patient requires a muscular effort, muscular activity to bring the two lips together. And how do you diagnose that in the clinic? Simply, we look to the mentalis muscle, because mentalis muscle is the muscle, it's the muscle that will stretch to bring the two lips together. Mentalis located here, so if the page, if the lips will meet together by stretching the muscles, then this labiumental fold will become obliterated, will become shell, and then we'll start to have a dimpling of the chin because this is the insertion of the mentalis muscle. So you can see dimpling, dimpling of the chin. There will be no labiumental fold, so that's you know how you have an incompetent uh, lips. This is another example. If you can see here, the patient is making a muscular effort to bring the two lips together. Here again, you see that there is a space between the upper and lower lip, and the patient is forcing, is making an uh, effort to bring the two lips together. So now, after you examine the lip competency, and you need to see how the patient achieve an anterior oral seal. Now, to remind you that the patient can't swallow, or not the patient, anyone on this planet, they can't swallow food unless you achieve anterior oral seal. So how the patient can achieve anterior oral seal? If the patient has a competent lip, then uh, definitely he's gonna bring the two lips together. They are touching already with minimal muscular effort. So the patient will have a competent lip, it will be um, simple lip to lip contact. But if the patient has incompetent lip, then the, we call this swallowing button forced lips. So basically the patient is exerting, exerting muscular effort to bring the two lips together. We call this forced lips. The other method is what we call it lip to the palate. So if you can see here, this is the lip and a, in these patients usually they have an increased overjet and reduced lower facial height with anterior growth rotation. So the lip will be trapped behind the upper incisors, touching the palate and time by time the patient will use the lower lip contacting the palate to achieve the anterior oral seal. We call this lip to the palate oral seal or lip trap because the lip is trapped behind the upper incisors. Now when the lip is trapped behind the upper incisors, it will push the upper incisors forward, it will push the lower incisors posteriorly, and the overjet as an end result will be increased. We'll have a huge overjet. The th third method is that we call it tongue to the lower lip or tongue thrust. So simply the tongue will jump between the upper and lower incisors until it reaches the lower lip to achieve an anterior oral seal. Now, when you have something like that, you are expecting that the tongue is sitting between the upper and lower incisor, preventing their eruption. So we'll have an anterior open bite and because it's sitting on top of the incisors, so it will cause proclination to the incisors, upper and lower. Now, however, now we don't know which one came first, like a chicken and egg. Was it that there is an anterior open bite and the tongue was a good guy trying to help and achieve anterior oral seal? Or was it that the patient has a normal teeth and the tongue is just jumping and causing this problem? Uh, we don't know for sure whether the tongue being the good guy or the bad guy, but according to the prophet, to, to the contemporary orthodontic textbook and prophet, he said, that William Prophet, that uh, it's more likely that the tongue being a good guy and he's trying to adapt to the skeletal discrepancy that is already there. We call this tongue, we call this positioning of the tongue called tongue thrust. And it has two types, endogenous tongue thrust and adaptive or secondary tongue thrust. Endogenous slash primary tongue thrust is when the tongue is sitting permanently all the time between the upper and lower incisor. And this has happened in patients with syndromes in which the tongue is big in size. So there is no place for the tongue to go but to stay between the upper and lower teeth. We call this endogenous tongue thrust or primary tongue thrust. And here, definitely the tongue is the cause of the malocclusion that the patient has because the tongue will be sitting there all the time. Now, the second time is called the adaptive tongue thrust. 
or secondary tongue thrust, in which here that we have the debate whether the tongue being the good guy or the bad guy. I as mentioned before, we do believe that the tongue is just trying to correct or to uh, compensate for the anterior open bite. However, we don't have enough uh, evidence. Then the lip position, we have the nasolabial angle, which basically the angle between the tangent of the philtrum and the tangent of the columella of the lips. So this is the nasolabial angle. Now, nasolabial angle affected by many things, by the inclination of the incisor. So the incisor is retrocline. This one will go posteriorly and the angle will be increased. Or the position of the maxilla as a whole. So if the maxilla is retrognathic, then this line or this angle will become bigger. So we'll have an uh, increased nasolabial angle. Or the other option is the tip of the nose elevated. And when the tip of the nose elevated, then the nasolabial angle will be increased. Now, the normal nasolabial angle is between 85 into 120. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one of the etiology for an increased nasolabial angle is that the tip of the nose is elevated. So how can, and by the way, this is normal nasolabial angle for Middle Eastern population. If you want to go to the Caucasian population, it's between 90 and 110 as a normal nasolabial angle. Now, if you want to, if you have a patient and you have an increased nasolabial angle and you think, okay, is that because the maxilla is retrognathic or the teeth are retroclined or the tip of the nose elevated? So what can we do is to use a true horizontal line passing through subnasal. And then we measure this angle and between the philtrum and the, this true vertical line. And we call this the upper compartment angle. And the normal value is 12 to 24. Then the other angle is called the upper lip inclination and should be between 79 and 85. So if I have an increased uh, patient and I examined him, he has a 130 nasolabial angle. So I need to know what is the etiology. And then you measure the upper compartment and you find it 45. So that means that the upper compartment is increased. That means that the patient has an elevated tip of the nose. So this is how we use the nasolabial angle. Then you look at something we call it the labiomental fold, which is basically between the chin, admitted the deepest concavity, and uh, the labial surface. The normal angle value is 130 to 100, uh, 110 to 130. Now, this angle will be affected by the chin and by the lip. How is that? If the lips are retruded due to the retroclined upper incisor, then this labiomental angle will be shallow. If the teeth are excessively proclined, so the lip will be proclined and we will have reduced this uh, angle. If the chin is a progenic, the chin is well developed, then this angle will be reduced as well. And the opposite if the chin is underdeveloped. A couple of more lines that help us to decide the relationship between the chin, nose and the lips is called the E line or the Ricketts line, which basically connect pronisali, which is the most prominent part of the chin, but the nose or the beak of nose uh, and then uh, the buconium which is the most prominent part of um, sorry I have to move slide the most prominent part of mandibular symphysis now the lower lip should be two millimeter posterior to this line and the upper lip should be two milli four millimeter posterior to this line however when you use racket I just want you to make sure that you're careful because that works mostly with the uh, white or Caucasian population rather than the Middle Eastern population. The other line is the Steiner line, which goes from Bogonian into the middle of the nose, and then the upper and lower through the middle distance between pronasally and subnasally, the upper and lower lip should be sitting on this line. We call this line the Steiner line. But again, using these lines to decide the lip position should be careful, because again, these lines are used in a population that is different with different perception. So we have to be sure that we can use something that is acceptable by our patients. Now the tongue, as we mentioned before about the tongue thrust and how it moves between the upper and lower teeth to achieve anterior oral seal. Uh, so that was it for the extra oral assessment. Now next lecture will be talking about the intraoral assessment.